off to a great start this morning. Uh, it's great to see everybody out. Uh, I'm really, really excited for this. I think this is a unique opportunity. Uh, the little background how this how this came about. Uh, we got a text some of us uh, men uh, this week saying that the uh, void for the lesson was open, and I checked my schedule and saw that I was on the communion talking after about a few hours of no one stepping up and uh, claiming the spot. Uh, I said, you know what, this might be a good opportunity with me having the Lord's Supper talk to have a day focused on what Jesus did for us. And I thought, well, what a great opportunity it could be for me to kind of combine the Lord's Supper talk and the lesson uh, and, and kind of give an overview and, and an extended version of why we do what we do every Sunday. Uh, Brace read for us the institution of the Lord's Supper read in Luke chapter 22, but where I want to start off this morning is actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles want to follow along a little bit this morning, we'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 17 through 33. This is uh, kind of Paul uh, talking to the church at Corinth and giving an overview of, of what Jesus instituted that day and kind of his thoughts surrounding that as well. And so in starting in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What do you not have houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have, no who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the, on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he, had given it, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we, are, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that he may not be condemned, that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about other things. I will give direction when I come. Thanks for bearing with me there. I know that was a lot, but I think there's a lot of importance. I love the uh, account that Paul gives and kind of the direction he gives, kind of focusing on exactly what Jesus was saying that day. So really what I want to do for an outline this morning is I want to uh, take a little time here at the beginning to talk about the institution and what that means, what that looked like, and why we do exactly what we do every Sunday. And then I want to go into a little bit of significance, look at another passage and see exactly what Jesus did for us and what that means is this, the significance of that. And then actually I'm going to have James come up here after that, lead a song to prepare our minds to actually partake in the Supper of the Lord and then go ahead and partake in that and then I'll come back here and give a few thoughts on application and how we apply that to our lives outside of this building and through our day-to-day -day lives. And then I will offer an invitation to those who need it. But what I want to talk about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I'm going to start in verse kind of 17 through 22, that first beginning part. And if we realize what it says, um, let's see, in verse 20, it says, When you come together, it is not the sup Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. Do you not have houses to eat in or drink in? Or do you just despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say? To you, shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. We understand here that Paul's trying to tell us this is not a, a meal, an ordinary meal, right? We don't come together to eat when we're hungry for this meal. That's not what this is about. A lot of people may, I mean, I don't know, may think, uh, may not think a lot about it, but at the same time, I think uh, what, what the message here, uh, starting in, in verse 17, 
is that it's not a normal meal. It's not something we should, we should really, uh, oh, there's a word I'm looking for, and I've been thinking about it this whole time, and I knew I wouldn't remember it. Uh, but kind of associate, there you go. And it's not as to associate with the normal meal we eat at home. And that's exactly what it's saying in verse 22, right? Don't, do you not have a house to eat in or drink in, right? This is not associated with the normal meal. This is something that's special. This is something that's different and has a different significance than normal eating. So if it's not a normal meal, why do we do it, right? Why are we eating and, and partaking of bread and partaking of juice uh, during our morning service? What is, if it's not about a meal, what is it truly about? Well, we look on, look on verse 23, right? For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given, it, given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and after, the, after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what this is about. Don't take this for your hunger. Don't take this for your thirst. Take this in remembrance of me. Because why? What does it mean? What is the significance of that? What, why did he institute it this way? For remembrance of me in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's not only for remembrance, but it's also a proclamation. That we stand here together and we partake of this meal, right? No ordinary meal, a, a separate meal that is special in the remembrance of what he did for us. And the meal that it was instituted so that we could remember that what he did for us and the salvation that he gives us. And, and it's something I want to focus on this morning. If we look in the account in Luke that um, Bryce read for us, and we look in this account here in Paul talking about the Lord's Supper, it actually doesn't give a specific instance on how often we should do like, it. It doesn't say we should do this every Sunday. Every Sunday you come together, it, it doesn't give that specific instruction. Now, it, it does say when you come together as often as you do this, it, we can kind of take it a little bit that way. But what, what I want to realize this morning is it's not really a scriptural thing. Uh, it's not scripturally based that every Sunday when you come together, you should partake of the Lord's Supper. But, but don't worry, I'm not here to say that we should stop taking it every Sunday. I'm actually doing quite the opposite. I want to talk about how special it is that we do it every Sunday. How special it is that when we do come together in a setting like this, we do partake of the Lord's Supper. And, it, and, and it's not for, you know, it's not for fun. It's not something we do to fill our time in service. The reason we do it is something that's special. And something that we, we often take for granted. Because a lot of the times I feel like I've, I've been in this situation where it's a part of the checkbox of my worship service Sunday list, right? That as long as I got my Lord's Supper in, I got the checkbox, I can go home thinking, okay, I completed all the steps in my worship service this morning. But not thinking about why it was instituted. Not thinking about why exactly I'm doing it in that moment. Have we all been there? That sometimes it just passes our mind on why we're doing it. And I think that's something that's kind of dangerous. I think that's something that we often find ourselves in because, once again, this checkbox check mentality is something that we can all struggle with. We come to church on Sunday morning thinking, okay, we need to have these couple songs. We need to have this uh, reading and prayer, right? And then the Lord's Supper fits in there where it needs to fit, and, and everything's good when I leave because my, my boxes are checked. But we need to understand that's not the exact way we need to look at it, that this is something that's special, have you, once again, have you read verse 26? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, for you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Are we instructed to do this every single Sunday at 9 a.m. when you come to church? Is this an exact requirement we need to do? I don't think it's something we can say for sure, but let's, let's, let's go away from that and think about how special it is that we do do it. Right? How special it is that we do take the time on Sunday mornings to talk a little bit about what Jesus did for us. And that's why I'm so excited for this this morning, because I think it's, it's, it's really important that every once in a while we have a full Sunday morning dedicated to what he did for us. A full Sunday morning to really deep into the scriptures and really understand the significance of that one meal we partake in every Sunday together. And that key word together. Let's remember that. And something I want to talk about a little bit more, too. Right? It's, and let's remember, it's special because we take the time to remember and proclaim the significance in that death. 
but it, it also does come with instructions. Let's look at verse 27. Let's go ahead and read this again, 27 to the end of the chapter. Uh, Whoever therefore eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks of judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be con- condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. As if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgments about other things. I will have give directions when I come. There's an emphasis and stress on what we do when we come together to do it, right? Like it says in verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together, wait for one another. But the real emphasis and the real instruction before that is you have to examine yourself. You can partake of this meal in an unworthy manner, can't you? You, It's all about our heart. It's all about our faith, and it's all about where we place this in our heart. And I really think you're taking it in an unworthy manner if you come here and think it's a checkbox to do. That, that's kind of that's how I view it. If you come here, you don't apply yourselves to what you're doing. You don't uh, focus your mind and focus your heart on what you're doing. I think that's an unworthy manner. But we also have to examine ourselves with God. Do we understand truly what he did for us? Are we partaking of the bread and partaking of the cup, understanding what that means? And understanding that that bread was on that cross one day, right? And what that represents, the flesh that was torn, that was beaten, and the blood that was shed. Do we understand what that means? And I think that's why he asks us to examine ourselves here. Because that is is crucial to understanding a true relationship with God. And that if you're partaking in this supper without a true relationship with God and understanding, do you know what you're doing? And are you fully connected and focused on the meaning of what we're doing? What we're doing. And that's when it stresses the emphasis on when we come together to do it, right? Um, this is a, a, a kind of controversial topic, I guess, but all I have to say about it is it's special. The, another reason why it's so special to come together on Sunday mornings to partake of this meal is because we do it together, right? And, and I, I really like the, uh, we have a time to really examine ourselves during the passing of the trades. We have a moment of silence where we can really connect with our Father and, and, and analyze our relationship with God and understand why we partake of it. But at the same time, that is a little personal, but at the same time, we're doing it together. We come together, we talk about it together, we create fellowship. And how important is fellowship, right? How important is that fellowship? Because once again, well, our relationship with God is personal, and we talked a little, bit about, a little bit about that this morning in class, but how amazing is it that we have each other to do this with? And how amazing is it we have the examples in Scripture talking about, uh, when, when it's talking about the Lord's Supper, it was never done by yourself. It was always done with people of like-minded faith who came together realizing why it was instituted, realizing why they do it and the importance behind it. It is so special. It is that special. Because once again, I don't think we can do this relationship with God thing truly by ourselves. I couldn't do it. And the reason why coming to church is so important to me is because I have a family who is willing to help me with that race. Because it's a hard race. Right? That relationship with God is not an easy task. And we have been given a resource. But once again, I, I kind of said uh, coming to church. But I would love to see here in the future, and I think we will, uh, a relationship with one another and fellowship with one another outside this building. Because as, as stressed as it is uh, in this passage talking about fellowship within the Lord's Supper, we take that fellowship that we have with each other through the connection we have to Christ and take that into our lives with one another. And let's go add to the body together. And let's go show everyone what we have together. Because we have a family here. And how special is it that when we come together and remember what Jesus did for us, we can do that together. We can help each other realize different things. I've learned so many things from different people on their relationship with God and the views they have about the death of Jesus and how much that means to them. And how emotional it gets people. It gets me emotional. You know why it gets me emotional? Because I didn't deserve that. Did you deserve it? What he did on that cross that day, I did not deserve it. And that's why it gets me emotional, but that's, again, why it's so special. Because we come together in fellowship in a room like this, not a deserving one in this building. But at the same time, he loves us so much that he didn't care. That he didn't look back. He went on that cross willingly, knowing that uh, the pain he was going to go through. He did it for us, knowing that we didn't even deserve it, but that was the only hope we had to reach that eternal life. 
And that's why it's so crucial. And that's why it's so important to understand the true, uh, true act of what happened that day and what that means to us, but what that means altogether. And what that means to us as a whole collective group as well. Do you know what he did for you that, that, that day? Do you know what he went through on behalf of your soul? That your soul that didn't deserve one bit of it? Do you know what he went through? Let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's go over to Isaiah 53. A passage often used in a time like this, in a setting like this. But once again, I, the, the goal for me using Isaiah 53 this morning is to read it verse by verse. But to really uh, create graphic images in your mind. That sounds weird. I know that sounds weird, but really understand what this passage is saying. Beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 53, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at it, look at him, and no beauty we should desire him. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and one... As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, and stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The wounds caused by the piercing and the... Uh, the piercing and crushing of his uh, of what it, it went through in that in verse five, right? That's how we are healed. Continue on in verse six. Sorry, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid him laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that like a sheep that was led like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who was considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his, soul, uh, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see an offspring. Uh, he shall prolong his days. The, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes the intercession for the transgressors. That's what he did for you. That's exactly what he went through for you. Did you read the first few verses, especially starting in verse 3? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one who men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Let me ask you a question. Do you know who the men are that are uh, referenced in this passage? Truly, do you know who those men are? It's us. We were on that street one, that, that same day mocking him, uh, despising him, and rejecting him. We were, we were there that day, I feel. We, in our own life, so many times I feel like have let him down by the time and time again that we've rejected him. He went through that with, for, for us. He was despised and rejected by men. And once again, in verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He did what for us, and how did we treat him because of that? He went through all that for us, and how exactly are we treating him? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed, and all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you see the importance and the significance in those words? Do you see exactly the, the brutal beating he went through? I can't imagine it. I can't. I, uh, a couple months ago, we had a guest speaker at the church we were up in, in, in Indy. And he had this whole uh, very sophisticated graphic lesson on what exactly happened that day. 
and he, he's, a, he, he's some sort of doctor of some sort, I think. And he, he kind of went through uh, all of the beatings he went through. And he, got, he gave a detailed lesson on exactly what those beatings did to Jesus. And the broken bones and the, the flesh that was ripped and all the scientific and, and, and doctor terms. I can't say because I know nothing about it. But it really put into perspective uh, on how much pain he went through for us that I can't even imagine. But if I was put in the same situation, if I was the son of God, I, I, would, I would fight for it. I'd be like, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. But that shows us how strong Jesus was and how weak we are. But we are made strong through him. We are made alive through him. That even though we are so weak and undeserving of what he did for us, we get the benefits of it anyways. The, the bad treatment we gave him and we continue to give him. The times in our life where we don't even look uh, his direction. The day-to-day -day life we live that doesn't even involve him. Other than maybe Sundays and Wednesdays, right? The way we treat him is so undeserving of what he did for us that day. He was despised. He was rejected. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. So those are some pretty big terms there. And pretty emotional if, you do, if, I, if I do say so. If you really connect with what that means, think about it. Think about it. He did that for you. Right? He did that for you. But he not only did it for all of us in this building today, he did it for the whole entire world. Those we look at and see that need help. Those that we look at that think, we, we think, right, we don't know for sure, but we think are not on the right path. Or uh, even other congregations around us that don't have the name Church of Christ on it. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for all of them too. He died for all of us. And that means something. And it's special, but we're so undeserving of it. And, and it gets to me, it's so hard, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to talk about. And the reason is because I know how undeserving I am. I know how many times in my life I've been the one despising and rejecting him. I know how many times in my life I've turned away from him and looked the other way. It never turned out good for me, I'll tell you that. And every time I've looked to, towards him, it, it turned out for the better. Even if I didn't think it would. Or even if I didn't see a better outcome. Or even if it wasn't the outcome I wanted, every single time when I turned to him, it was better. And that's proof that what he did for us stands. And it works and it's beautiful. And that's why it's hard to talk about. That's why I wanted to do this this morning. Because we need to understand how undeserved. I know, I know I'm kind of bashing that, right? That we're undeserving of it. But once again, that's the truth. I don't, I don't understand why he did it for me. But what I can understand now is that he did do it for me. And that he wouldn't go back. And he would do it again. I, I, I truly believe he would do it again for me. So undeserving, so unwilling, but at the same time, he doesn't care that that's the way I am. He wanted to do this for me so that I had a hope of heaven. And did you see, did you notice the way he reacted towards us? Verses 7 through 9 specifically. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a, sheep le like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation he was considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressors of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. I don't know about you, but when someone accuses me of something I didn't do, I speak up. Or if I'm about to go through something that I, I shouldn't go through, I speak up. I say something. I don't deserve this, right? I, I didn't do anything. This is not something I deserve. Do you think Jesus deserved to do that that day? Do you think the one who's lived a perfect life deserved to die like that? Do you truly think that? He didn't deserve one bit of it. You know who deserves a death like that? Me. You know who deserves a brutal death and a brutal end? Me. But what we see is that Jesus did not face a brutal end. He may have faced a brutal death. But he's saving us from that brutal end that we deserve. It means something. And the, the way he reacted to it really gets to me. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't say a word about it. I'm sure he was scared. I'm sure he had his doubts. But he trusted God. And that shows the power of trusting God, right? You'd probably think someone's crazy and said, hey, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to make you go through it anyways. 
You know, you're probably, you're crazy. He trusted God that much to know. But I, I think God opened his eyes to know how much we needed that and, and how much we were so lost without it. And that's the power of Scripture, right? And that's why I love Isaiah 53 so much, because it's truly opened my eyes to what he did for me. It truly opened my eyes to know that uh, I was one of those ones scoffing him and mocking him that day, but at the same time, he went through what he did for me. And that where, you know, I have to examine myself. Where would I be without that? What kind of life would I be living without that? And I've, I've seen people. I just got back from Las Vegas and saw uh, a very, uh, you know, place that, need, you know, everywhere needs Jesus. But at the, it really put into perspective for me that there is different options we have to live life. And I saw some pretty brutal options. But that could be me. It could be. I could be on the streets of a big city, uh, hyped up on drugs and and having an alcohol problem and uh, living a life of sin and and not having any purpose in life. But I truly believe I am who I am today because Jesus saved my soul. And I follow him for it. That's why I believe I am who I am today. Because he took it upon it himself. And I decided to follow that shows the power in following him and what he does and what he did for me. Let's read verse 10 through 12 again, and then we'll partake of it here in a moment of the Lord's Supper. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes the interces- makes inter- session for the transgressors this was supposed to happen the whole time this was in God's plan the whole time it was the will of the Lord but it it, it gives a very detailed uh, explanation there it was the will of the Lord to crush him right that sounds brutal but once again I trust in God and I trust in what he's doing so if it's his will to put Jesus through that maybe it was for something and not for any not for nothing I'm sure God looks around at this world and says, maybe it was for nothing. Uh, I, he probably doesn't. But at the same time, I, I kind of make that connection. If I were God, I'd look at the world and be like, that was for nothing. These people aren't following me. These, what are these people doing? I've given them everything, and they're still deciding not to follow me. We were talking this week. Um, uh, my wife brought up a good point that me, Aaron, and Angie, and uh, Caitlin and Doug were talking about. Um, how... If God destroyed the world so many years ago because it was that bad, I wonder why he's not destroyed it again. I look around, you know, I, like I said, we were in Vegas, and I look around, I was like, this world, look, this is this what this world has come to? This is, the, this is what people are deciding to do with their lives? But at the same time, it was the will of the Lord to do that, knowing that this is what the world would be like. But I think he did that because he knew what the world would look like and what the world did look like. He made this perfect, perfect world. And us sinners have destroyed it. But at the same time, there's hope. And there's a reason behind what he did. It was his will. What Jesus did up there was the will of God. It wasn't for nothing. And like I said, sometimes I feel like if I were God, I'd be like, this is for nothing. Nobody's following me. But at the same time, if God can have his children up in heaven with him. That was worth it to him. That was the will that he implemented. He poured out his soul into death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and he makes the intercession for the transgressors. So before we take of the Lord's Supper this morning, think about that. Think about the soul that he poured into that death and what he did for us. And, and when the trays are being passed, think about how you don't deserve it. I know, once again, I know that sounds harsh, but we think about what he did for you, knowing that you didn't deserve it. Think about what he did for you in the life that you live. Think, examine your life. Right? You may be here this morning, but what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing Tuesday? I know we get our you know, checkbox in again on Wednesday, but what about Thursday and Friday and Saturday? What does our life look like? And the reason I say this is because I need it. I need that reminder. I've, I've looked at my life recently, and uh, I've noticed that my, my life has been busy with work, with uh, the different activities, and even with family. 
Uh, even family, things like family can be distracting. And not a, you know, I'm not saying that to be, you know, but at the same time, you get so caught up in life that you realize, what has my life looked like with my relationship with God outside of this building? Is it fair to him that you live a life like that and he lived a life like that for you? Compare your, the life he lived for you to the life you're living for him. Is it for him? Right? Think about that. Think about what he did for you, what that means. We'll partake of the Lord's Supper here, and then we'll come together and talk about some application, a little bit more of that kind of thing, uh, and then we'll be led. Oh, actually, James is going to lead us in a song before that as well. Uh, so just but think about those things, and think about what we've talked about this morning, the meaning of that, and why it's so important. And even though maybe it wasn't set in stone on Sunday morning at, uh, you know, 1035, you should partake of the Lord's Supper, but how special it is that every week you get to re-